morning, everyone. I hope that you are all well and that everyone is staying safe and healthy. The Standing Committee on General Government will now come to order. We are here to resume public hearings on Bill 213, an act to reduce burdens on people and businesses by enacting, amending, and repealing various acts and revoking a regulation. We have the following members present in the room. MPP Catherine Fife. And the following members are participating remotely. MPP Glover, MPP Schreiner, MPP Skelly, MPP McDonnell, MPP Saller. Have any other MPPs joined us? We are also joined by staff from Legislative Research, Hansard and Broadcast and Recording. To make sure that everyone can understand what is going on, it is important that all participants speak slowly and clearly. Please wait until I recognize you before starting to speak. Uh, yes, MPP Fife. Thank you for recognizing me. I just wanted to ask you as the chair, uh, on Friday when we had delegations, uh, a M member uh, was making very disrespectful gestures on the Zoom call, and I feel I'm asking you to consider writing a letter to the delegations who, were, who witnessed that and apologizing on behalf of the entire committee. MPP Fife, I already, uh, that was already raised as a point of order, and I already reminded all members not to make any uh, gestures on the screen. Uh, if, if it continues, then I will consider your request. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We are also joined by staff from Legislative Research, Hansard, and Broadcast and Recording. Since it could take some time for your audio and video to come up after I recognize you, please take a brief pause before beginning. As always, all comments should go through the chair. Once again, in order to ensure optimal sound quality, members participating via Zoom are encouraged to use headphones and or microphones if possible. Are there any questions before we begin? Our presenters today have been grouped in threes for each one hour time slot. Each presenter will have seven minutes for their presentation and after we have heard from all three presenters, the remaining 39 minutes of the time slot will be for questions from members of the committee. This time for questions will be broken down into two rounds of seven and a half minutes for the government members, two rounds of seven and a half minutes for the official opposition, and two rounds of four and a half minutes for the independent members as a group. I will now call upon the United Church of Canada, Trinity St. Paul Centre for Faith, Justice and the Arts. Please state your name for the record and then you may begin. You will have seven minutes. Thank you. Yes, I'm Reverend Dr. Sherry DeNovo, uh, CM. Thank you for allowing me to present before you. Uh, I appear before you as a woman who has worked for 50 years to address a homo bi and transphobia in Canada and last year was honored to be awarded the Order of Canada for that work. In 1971, I was the only woman to sign We Demand, the first public demand for equal rights for LGB people. In 2001, I performed the first legalized same-sex marriage. And after my election in 2006 to this legislature, I passed the most LGBTQ pieces of legislation in Canada. They included Toby's Law, named after my trans church music director, adding trans rights to the Ontario Human Rights Code. A bill like all of my bills made law with all party support. One of the co-signatories of that bill was Deputy Premier Christine Elliott. She, I, and Yasser Nakbi, the other signatory, were given awards by parents, families, friends of lesbians and gays, delivered by the comedian and actress Rosie O'Donnell. I was saddened to hear that Ms. Elliott did not vote against Section 2 of this bill before us that gives university and degree granting status to Charles McVitie's Canadian Christian College, a man who has always opposed trans rights and the very existence of trans people. Why do I and many others consider granting a college accreditation that is to a, a college that espouses racist and homophobic views? Why is that wrong? It is because such views result in death. Some 33% of LGB children attempt suicide, and almost 50% of trans and non-binary children, as compared to 7% of straight children, attempt suicide. LGBTQ rights are at their heart about saving lives, particularly the lives of our most vulnerable children. Adding trans rights to the OHRC helped save lives. 
McVitie opposed that bill. He also opposed every other LGBTQ rights bill I was part of or originated and passed into law, like banning conversion therapy in Ontario in 2015, like parent equality for LGBTQ families, like the Trans Day of Remembrance in 2017 that Minister Lisa McLeod was a co-signatory on. Anything and everything that could prevent such deaths, Charles McVitie has opposed. In short, he's consistently opposed the will of this legislature. Let me be very clear, his views are not supported by mainstream Christianity. There is an entire network of recognized Christian seminaries in Ontario. Here in Toronto, the Toronto School of Theology under the University of Toronto includes Roman Catholic colleges, Presbyterian, Anglican, and the United Church of Canada colleges. The United Church of Canada, of which I am a part, having been ordained in 1996, is the largest Protestant denomination in Canada with over 2,000 churches and has been ordaining openly gay and lesbian clergy since 1988. <clears throat> All of the Toronto Schools of Theology are bound and adhere to the inclusive policies of the University of Toronto. McVitie often pretends to speak for the Roman Catholic community, but Pope Francis himself has supported same-sex civil marriage and advocates for the love of all people. Our Catholic school system has supported gay-straight alliances, the health and physical education curriculum, again, both initiatives that Mr. McVitie opposed. It is certainly not Christian to hate one's neighbor, as McVitie does with our Muslim neighbors, having called Islam hateful and a war machine, or our Jewish neighbors, who through the Canadian Jewish Congress opposed one of McVitie's other attempts in 1998 to achieve accreditation based on his anti-Semitism. Nor is a Christian to call Haitians practicing Satanists, another of McVitie's quotes. Biblically, Jesus says nothing about homosexuality, but does say 2,000 years before Lady Gaga in Matthew 19.12 that some are born not finding heterosexual marriage their calling, or some are born that way. Taking instances of homophobia out of context, as McVitie does, is poor biblical exegesis and poor scholarship. By that measure, we would be condoning slavery and a myriad of other now justifiably illegal acts. The Christian television station here in Canada representing conservative Christianity removed McVitie's show from the air because of his views. And CTS is known as the voice of the evangelical Christian community. The Canadian Broadcast Standards Council condemned him as well for such lies as suggesting homosexuals prey on children. The Conservative Sun News Network has also disavowed him. As far as being degree granting, Premier Bill Davis, a conservative, opposed giving the Canadian Christian College degree granting status in 1983, seeing it as part of what were called degree mills back then. Questionable financial practices like loans totaling almost $900,000 from his own college by Mr. McVitie and his son would not be tolerated in a legitimate university. The Post-Secondary Education Quality Assessment Board has not vetted the Canadian Christian College either. The Ontario Confederation of University Faculty Associations have also condemned the potential degree-granting status of the Canadian Christian College. I appeal to the Conservative members of this panel, whose party has acted in the best interests of our vulnerable and our precious children in our past by voting for equal rights by the LGBTQ community. All the bills now law I've mentioned. Don't recast your party as the voice, as the voice of One homo bi, transphobia and racism. Keep your own faith and your own tradition alive. May I remind those assembled here of a quote by the great hero and theologian of the German Christian resistance to Hitler. Silence in the face of evil is evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. To conclude, let me say to all those of you on this committee, it is evil to promote hatred. To you who love and desire to protect our most vulnerable, do not allow hatred to pass as love. Do not allow hatred to pass as faith. Our children and all of us are counting on you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we turn to our next presenter, I just wanted to confirm, uh, MPP Mike Harris, can you please confirm that you are MPP Harris and that you are in Ontario? Thank you, Madam Chair. I am MPP Mike Harris and I'm here in Toronto. Thank you. And MPP Sabawi, can you please confirm that you are MPP Sabawi and that you are in Ontario? 
Good morning, Chair. Uh, this is MPP Sabawi calling from Mr. Saga. Thank you. We'll now turn to our next presenter, Greyhound Canada Transportation. Please state your name for the record, and then you may begin. You will have seven minutes. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Stuart Kendrick, Senior Vice President of Greyhound Canada. I appreciate the opportunity today to uh, speak to the committee on uh, Bill 213. Uh, days after the pandemic lockdown, Greyhound ridership uh, declined by 95%. Uh, the company maintained operations, however, had to scale down the, uh, the scheduled service as we saw the impacts of the pandemic and unfortunately had to suspend service on uh, around May 12th. Uh, the ridership on the uh, on each schedule that we operate, uh, you know, pre during the pandemic was at a level that was not sustainable. Uh, this impacted about 400 employees who have been laid off um, and since continue to be laid off. Greyhound's ridership in Ontario predominantly carries uh, women, uh, students, average age of under 24, seniors, and First Nations people. All have been left without inner city bus service. When the uh, red tape bill containing the inner city bus deregulation provision was tabled in legislators legislature, we were caught off guard with the timing. I think the timing of the bill has somewhat uh, left the industry a bit perplexed. Uh, with ongoing uh, issues with ridership and revenue, even before the pandemic, the timing of this bill is one that is up for discussion, both within the private bus industry and hopefully here today. At the best of times, deregulation uh, would mean uh, uh, the end of service to smaller communities. And really in a normal environment, these communities have been obviously at risk for years due to the low ridership operating authorities that some of the private sectors have today and businesses have value have asset values will be worthless and in post pandemic world there seems to be this uh, discussion that the rural communities will have more uh, comp competition the competition uh, with the when the rural communities will end we've seen that uh, communities across canada when deregulation took place had many of their communities lost the, uh, the increase in competition, will you'll see it will be on Highway 400, 401, London to Toronto, Toronto to Ottawa. I think it raises the issue on uh, Quebec. Quebec, my understanding is, will not deregulate, and this will cause an unfair playing field for the private businesses. The private inner city bus companies rely on the fare box. They don't receive subsidized money from uh, municipal, federal, or provincial governments. Recently, uh, the private bus carriers have been in discussions with Metrolinx on looking at ways to harmonize operations, facilities, and integrate customer service and ticketing, which has is, is really been a, a big step in the last 10 to 15 years with these discussions recently. The, uh, the, the proposal to deregulate you know, puts these discussions on hold and in fact could, could in fact uh, you know, really end the discussions. I think today the important thing is to understand that the timing of this bill during a pandemic when most of the private carriers, if not all, are on their knees financially and looking to the government at different levels for support on how we come out of this post-pandemic is really continues to be the big impact. <clears throat> the, the opening up of the uh, of deregulating the bus industry raises some safety concerns. You have new entrants that will look at coming in and operating predominantly, we think, on Highway 401. And I think it's very important that the, the regulators look at the safety, insurance, and really the feasibility of these companies to make sure that they will be viable. Uh, our experience in deregulation and, and, and companies that come into the business is that when they're not able to remain viable based on the fare box revenue, you have to be careful that they don't cut on safety, insurance, and driver training. If the government is uh, not looking to withdraw the deregulation during the pandemic, it's the private sector and Greyhound's recommendation that they look at a, a delay in the, in the implementation date, which will allow the private bus carriers to come out of the pandemic and try to rebuild the business while customers get the, you know, get the, uh, 
the ability to look at the trends they're seeing with the traveling sector and the confidence back in riding on public transit. I'd like to take this time to recognize the fact that the inner city community funding program, which has addressed some of the gaps in the rural funding is one that we think is a great opportunity for Ontario to allow connectivity into the main corridors and something that uh, should be looked upon as a permanent solution to some of the gaps that you've seen in rural sector. Right now you have the, uh, the ability or the Ontario government has the ability to uh, allow Go Transit and Metrolinx uh, and Ontario Northland to fill a lot of those gaps and you've seen that over the last several years. Again, I'd like to take the uh, opportunity to thank the committee for allowing me to speak today and look forward to some of the questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this point, we'll turn to our third presenter, Parkbridge Lifestyle Communities, Inc. Please state your name for the record and then you may begin. You will have seven minutes. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Robert Voigt. Uh, I'm joined here virtually today by Sandy Higgins. Um, I am the Director of Planning for Parkbridge Lifestyle Communities, and Sandy is Parkbridge's Vice President of Development. Um, I'd also note that I'm a registered professional planner with over 25 years experience, including 17 as a civil servant. Uh, good morning, and thank you to the Standing Committee on General Government for the opportunity to speak today about Bill 213. We appreciate the opportunity to address the committee today about Schedule 21 of the bill, which specifically proposes changes to Section 50 of the Planning Act. Parkridge applauds Ontario's government's bold commitment to cut red tape and streamline Ontario's burdensome planning process. We believe that this is an important and overdue step towards delivering more supply and choice to Ontario's overstretched housing market. Parkridge is Canada's largest owner, operator, and developer of land lease communities. And we have 30 vibrant residential communities in Ontario and more in development. And these communities are home to over 10,000 homeowners. I'm sure you appreciate that the Planning Act and Section 50 specifically have a significant impact on our day-to-day -day business of providing affordable homes to Ontarians. Parkridge has no concerns with the proposed changes to Section 50 of the Planning Act, and I believe that they can move forward on their own merits. However, we believe now is the right time to do more. We are proposing additionally highly targeted changes to Section 46 and 50 of the Planning Act. If passed, these overdue changes would unlock affordably priced homeownership options that reflect the value and choice offered by land lease home ownership because fundamentally, land lease is a form of home ownership. Land lease gives Ontarians a, ho a housing choice in which they own their homes without having to buy the land. This creates a more attainable home ownership option with all the benefits of a vibrant community for approximately 30% less than a comparable freehold home in the same municipality. That's why land lease is a popular and growing home ownership option for middle income home buyers, especially downsizing retirees. Contemporary land lease communities can also be a highly affordable home ownership option that is ideal for first time home buyers and young families. However, they're traditionally facing unnecessary barriers in securing financing that they need. They typically have less than 20% down payment and require high ratio mortgages. This is very different from most of our seniors buyers who purchase a home from earned equity after downsizing. Recent changes uh, by CMHC have opened the door for new home buyers to access CMHC insured mortgages similar to those readily available for freehold homes, condominiums, and even mobile homes. However, outdated red tape in the Planning Act means that these first time home buyers cannot meet the requirements of financial institutions for term of tenure or lease length that matches the most common mortgage amortization periods. Currently, the Planning Act prohibits leases longer than 21 years which creates this misalignment. As a result, 
these prospective home buyers cannot get the mortgage they need to buy a land lease home. That is why we are proposing targeted changes for consideration that will close the gap and enable thousands of more Ontario families to become homeowners. These proposed changes are highly focused, fall within the scope of the bill, and would have no impact upon the other changes to the Planning Act. In fact, it can be accomplished through two minor changes within the existing structure of Ontario's Planning Act, as it applies specifically to land lease communities. First, this minor change is necessary so that financial institutions like banks or credit unions are able to legally identify an individual home site in a land lease community for the purposes of approving a mortgage. For this, under Section 46 of the Planning Act, which is the section of the Act specifically only to land lease communities, the definition of parcel of land is updated to include both registered plans of subdivision and approved site plan agreements thereby reflecting the full range of planning tools used by municipalities to comprehensively review and approve the development of land lease communities. Secondly, under Section 50 of the Planning Act, a new subsection, 9.1, is added to make it clear that nothing in subsections 3 and 5 of that section prohibit entering into a lease for a land lease home for between 21 and 99 years, thereby extending those lease terms. Not only does this allow all community operators to offer land leases that conform with uh, or exceed typical mortgage amortization periods, it provides homeowners with even greater security in their tenure. We at Park Ridge are ready and eager to build homes and communities to meet the needs of Ontarians in municipalities province-wide. One minute. And it's not an exaggeration to say that addressing this outdated regulatory red tape is the last hurdle that we and our fellow community builders face to be able to offer this affordable home ownership options to thousands of first-time home buyers and families. Working together with Ontario government and these targeted changes, we can help address the growing housing affordability crisis and make the dream of home ownership a reality for thousands of more families in the province. We will provide a copy of our proposed updates to section 46 and 50 to the committee for review and both sandy and i thank you for your time and consideration and happy to address the questions during the question period thank you thank you very much at this point we'll turn to the independent member for four and a half minutes mvp schreiner you may begin thank you chair and i really uh, want to thank all three presenters for being at committee today and i'm hoping in my two rounds to be able to ask uh, each of you questions i'm going to begin uh, by uh, Direct my first question to Sherry DeNovo, and welcome back to Queens Park virtually. And uh, I just, I'm given given the work you've done around um, updates to the Ontario Human Rights Code. Um, do you believe that practices at uh, Canadian Christian College are in compliance with the Ontario Human Rights Code? Uh, no, absolutely not. They are not in compliance with, with the Ontario Human Rights Code, which makes them very different from all the other theological colleges that do give degrees. Uh, that, for example, I, I gave the example of all of the colleges under Toronto School of Theology, where uh, they have signed on to University of Toronto's inclusive practices, which is in part upholding the Ontario Human Rights Code. So there is no problem with Christian colleges upholding the Ontario Rights Code uh, and being inclusive. But the very fact that Christian Canadian Christian College espouses uh, through Charles McBeady, their spokesperson, um, uh, particularly particularly homo bi and transphobic um, uh, policies is is absolutely outside the realm of of uh, I argued Christianity and universities. And do you think it's possible to separate Canadian Christian College as an institution from Charles McVitie as president and his own personal views absolutely not and and as i pointed out you know the fact that they use it as a personal piggy bank with nine hundred thousand dollars worth of loans to McVitie and his son this, that kind of practice uh it, it would be absolutely condemned and illegal for legitimate universities so i mean again there, there are lots of red flags here um and in particular the rejection from his own conservative christian community through cts through sun news network um 
as I said before, Bill Davis rejected this application back in the day in 83. And um, so, so even speaking from within the conservative, progressive conservative framework, uh, his college has been rejected time and time again. And do you believe that requiring a pastor's note for admittance to Canadian Christian College is a discriminatory admissions process? Absolutely. Absolutely it is. I mean, again, when you look at the other Christian colleges, no such note is required, you know. Um, this, this isn't part of the process of going through seminary, of getting a Master's of Divinity or a, you know, a Bachelor of Theology or Religion. This, this is not part of any of that. Um, so, so again, um, you know, I was, I, I was kind of given a high five uh, before I came to testify. Uh, before you today from my own alma mater from Emmanuel College, part of Victoria University, but but also from Presbyterians, from Catholics, Anglicans, I know. I mean, I, again, the vast majority of the Christian community in Canada uh, does not uphold the views of Charles Buffetti. Yeah, and do you believe that uh, Canadian Christian College uh, engages in discriminatory One hiring minute. practices when it comes to uh, its process for hiring faculty? Of course it does, you know, you know um, out, people who are out and LGBTQ2 plus um, are rejected from being faculty, of course um, they are. So, I mean, this is, this is very clear in their hiring practices, which is discriminatory under the OHRC. Uh, and of course, it's also their policies that make it um, impossible to be a student there if you are openly and proudly uh, LGBTQ2 plus. And I think you've stated this, but I just want to be clear for the record, you're not aware of any other Christian college or university in Canada, that, in, or at least in Ontario, let's say, that engages in such discriminatory practices? Well, at Toronto School of Theology, again, that's St. Mike's College and others, Regis College, two Catholic colleges there, um, Knox College, Presbyterian, Wycliffe and Trinity, Anglican Colleges, you know, all at uphold the University of Toronto inclusive standards. Thank you. That's all the time we have. We'll now turn to the official opposition for seven and a half minutes. MPP Fife, you may begin. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to all presenters. Um, I'm going to continue on the same vein uh, to uh, former MPP DeNovo. Good to see you, Sherry. Uh, we, we heard also from the 519 um, on Friday. We had a full day of uh, delegations as well. Uh, they, they provided a very strong uh, legal perspective on fights that have already happened, and this would be having to do with Western University, which actually had gone to the Canadian Supreme Court around hiring practices what do you what how how does this square with you know more legal action that this government is brazenly moving into given the given the courts the the conflict that they've already had with the courts can you speak to that i, I suspect that this will be um provoke a, a number of challenges, both at the Ontario Human Rights Commission and, of course, um, through uh, the Supreme Court and through the court system as well. Um, absolutely, it is discriminatory. But I think more to the point, I, I'm trying here to appeal to the Conservatives um, who have a majority government and can decide to take this section out of this bill if they so choose that they themselves have been on record in supporting LGBTQ2 plus rights. Yeah. They have co-signed bills. Uh, so how can you know uh, the Deputy Premier Christine Elliott or the Cabinet Minister Lisa McLeod, how can they let this pass uh, knowing as they do that they have signed on to bills that support equal rights for LGBTQ2 plus people. Yeah, and I think, and you know, of course you know that also uh, the official opposition put forward a motion uh, last Wednesday, it did pass, and, and it, to condemn the direction that Schedule 2 is taking us in. And a number of uh, Conservative MPPs chose obviously not to partake in that vote so that the NDP opposition motion passed. So, I mean, it really does speak to the pressure, uh, the internal pressure, I think, from the Premier's office to move Schedule 2 forward because the, you'll hear later on from PC members that this is simply a, a, a transparent process. Do you see it as a transparent process? Absolutely not. As I said, the, the own vetting process for new colleges and, and accrediting universities has not vetted them. 
um, Akufa has not vetted them. <clears throat> um, this has come before this legislature before since 1983, and it always has been rejected. So um, again, you know that's that's a huge history to overcome, and it's not. Uh, this is not partisan. This is a conservative history to overcome. Yeah. Uh, and, and and again, you know, uh, why now? Uh, good question. Um, what what hold does Charles McVitie have over the premier? And that's the question I think that is pertinent to this. Uh, that's not my area of expertise. I'll leave that to others. But the very fact that they didn't show up to vote says something. As I said. The quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, to not speak is to speak, and to not act is to act. So um, so I would really challenge those members who have spoken um, about LGBTQ plus uh, rights and have said that there is no contradiction between that and voting conservative. Uh, if they truly believe that, then act it, then speak it, and then take this schedule out of this bill. Thank you very much for your testimony today. I'm going to move on to Stuart Kendrick from Greyhound. Stuart, thank you very much for your presentation as well. Uh, I think you, you made a very salient point to, to bill, bill 213 as it relates to creating the potential for an unfair playing field between Ontario and Quebec by the measures that are taken within this bill. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, provide some greater clarity around that. So please go ahead. Sure. Uh, you have a lot of private charter carriers that, you know, right now with the timing of this announcement, you know, are, are basically got zero revenue. And so uh, probably your nearest province, Quebec, uh, in a deregulated environment will be able to come into Ontario and operate charters, uh, you know, post pandemic or, or even in a normal environment. And that really uh, creates an unlevel playing field. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the Ontario companies. Uh, you also have the U.S. component of uh, carriers that could come into the market as well and, and really create uh, turmoil for, for the Ontario companies that rely on charters as well as scheduled service uh, product to, to really stay, stay viable and alive. Thank you. So uh, just for those who are home, I mean, G213 repeals the Public Vehicles Act and dissolves the Ontario Highway Transport Board, deregulating Ontario's private intercity bus service, and it amends the Highway Traffic Act to give the LGNC broad regulatory authority over passenger transportation vehicles. Uh, you raised a very good point, uh, Stuart, around the timing of this. Uh, I know also that there was a lack of, of, of consultation. So it doesn't strike me that this is actually better for people and smarter for business. If you're in the if you're in the bus service, if you're in the if you're in the business of delivering uh, passenger transportation services, why why the timing? I mean, because you did make you you made a very salient point around the timing of this particular section. Can you can you speak to that, please? Sure. I think uh, when you look at the business that we're in, the timing really is around what's going on globally and on the pandemic side and the impact. We, we all know it's had a massive impact to all business, but on the travel and tourism and the private bus carriers in Ontario, we rely on ridership. No fair, we have to survive off of fare box revenue. So fare box revenue has dried up to really zero. So as you come out of this uh, pandemic and you, you, you hope that, you know, there's a vaccine and everything turns around overnight, uh, but I don't think that's going to happen overnight with respect to the customers that rely on charter and uh, scheduled bus service. Yeah. Uh, they've got to get confident to travel again. So the timing of deregulating and, op and opening this up during the pandemic really is, is one that, has, that needs to be reviewed as uh, the private bus carriers come out of this and hopefully survive. Okay, thank you very much. That was that's very helpful, Stuart, uh, Sandy, and Robert. I'll get you in my next such section of questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We'll now turn to the government for seven and a half minutes. MPP Skelly, you may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, everyone. And I'd like to thank all of the presenters who are with us this morning. My first line of questioning is with Robert Voigt, and uh, as we all know, the shortage of housing uh, has been a, an, an issue across Ontario for many, many years. But of, of course, COVID-19 has exacerbated the situation I see in my area of Hamilton in the GTHA. A number of, of people fleeing, really, Toronto and a lot of the uh, vertical living and looking for land where they can put their feet on the ground. 
and that ha has uh, really had a huge impact on not only a shortage but of course on the on the price of housing i have never really understood or to be quite honest with you um heard about a land lease so robert can you actually take me to the beginning and explain to me what you're talking about when you refer to a land lease and um and who that would benefit uh it it's it's relatively actually easy uh, to understand in the sense that it's the homeowner owns the home but does not purchase the land. Uh, it's very similar in that sense, the way you might see a lot of um, uh, commercial activities done in that similar way. Or you may have heard of community land trusts as well, uh, where it's the same kind of thing. So really, the situation is that the homeowner purchased the home and does not purchase the land and therefore that is the portion that is leased to them. Historically, this would have been, um, and still is the case, uh, that you might see with mobile home communities. That's the same setup, except with contemporary land lease. Um, what happens now is that these are stick-built homes. Uh, they're essentially uh, um, indistinguishable from any other kind of community of residential units. Uh, it's, uh, it's really quite simple because of that. That's where that 30% um, cost savings is because they're not purchasing the land. And that 30% is, is uh, you know, uh, a rule of thumb that uh, is applicable to any municipality that uh, uh, contemporary land lease uh, products are being delivered in Ontario. So I purchase a home. I'm um, um, part of a young couple that's purchasing their first home and they're looking at a home that's maybe we'll say about five hundred thousand dollars they pay uh three hundred and fifty thousand for the home what happens when they go to sell an upgrade um i'm actually going to get uh, sandy to answer that because he can go very deep into the details because he's been uh, in the industry for a couple of decades now sandy i think you're going to have to introduce yourself when um you first speak just so we have it on hand sir please sure um my name is uh, Sandy Higgins. I'm the Vice President of Development with Park Bridge Lifestyle Communities. I've been with the company a little over 18 years as we've grown the uh, land lease uh, from, you know, a small startup uh, in the margins through uh, disruption to try and bring it into the mainstream of housing in Ontario. But uh, to, do, to address your specific component, uh, what we find is land lease is no different uh, than uh, conventional housing when it comes to resale. And in fact, homeowners routinely build equity in their land lease homes. Uh, what we do find is these, these land lease communities are more cohesive uh, with a lot more lifestyle and uh, amenity offerings than a traditional freehold or, or generally a lot of condominium products. So uh, in addition to the home, uh, the communities are trading on the value of the community itself and the activity and energy within the community. So we see, particularly with a lot of our adult lifestyle communities, these are very energized communities that bring a lot of value uh, to the table. Uh, but in terms of resale, absolutely young families, seniors, uh, they're all seeing appreciation. So it's a way for them to get in the market earlier with a much lower down payment, um, you know, very favorable carrying costs, and they see themselves building equity over time, whether it's a first time family getting into the market or retirees looking to downsize and take uh, money out of the uh, equity they have in a larger home and, and use that as part of their retirement. Is there ever an opportunity or a um, uh, uh, situation where the owner of the land has to reclaim the land and somehow evict the tenant? Or how would that work if you, why would you, and, and could it possibly happen? And if so, what is the procedure? So generally speaking, uh, tenants have uh, security of tenure under the Rental uh, Housing Act. Uh, now, to your point, uh, short, shorter term tenure, uh, if, if tenants in a land lease community become month-to-month uh, -month tenants, uh, that can uh, reduce their security of tenure in the event of, of some issue. So if there's some 
uh, the, the land is no longer occupiable for some reason, uh, that could put it at risk, uh, which again is why a long, what we're advocating for today is moving from a 21-year less a day tenure to a 49, 99-year tenure, which would give tenants uh, or homeowners in land lease communities much better security of tenure because there's there's very, very little way at all to remove somebody who has a lease term on their home from a, a land lease community. So a longer lease term would be of tremendous benefit to, to the market, both in terms of what it can do for financing, but also improving the tenure of, of uh, homeowners in these homes. This sounds as if it has tremendous potential, and, and I'm, I'm one minute. There's a community in my own riding that um, is very similar. Um, why are we not, or, or what are the obstacles in place, and why are people, or maybe you can give me some examples of where it is, it is uh, working successfully. Well, we have uh, the largest land lease community in Canada in Innisfil, Sandy Cove Acres with 1,233 homes in it. It's a vibrant, energetic community. It's very successful. Homeowners there are able to sell their homes, uh, but they, there's over 100 uh, social and recreational committees there that support seniors uh, living and aging in place. Uh, we, I could give you dozens of examples of vibrant land lease communities. And unfortunately, it's the uh, slightly energetic you know, issue with the uh, current planning act that limits these leases to Thank 21 years. Thank you. That's years. all the time we have for this round. We'll now turn to the independent Green Party member. Uh, in the interest of fairness, because we do have a hard stop at 10, I'll be uh, shortening uh, everyone's time in equal proportion so that uh, every uh, group of uh, every group can get uh, equal amount of time for questions. So at this point, the independent Green Party member can begin. You will have three and a half minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And um, I'm going to direct my next uh, line of questioning to you, uh, Greyhound Transportation. So, Stuart, we've heard loud and clear from many transportation companies that this is the timing on these schedules are, are off. Um, I'm assuming that one of the motivations here, I don't know, but I'm assuming is to improve inner city bus transportation, particularly in underserviced areas, especially in rural communities. So do you have some thoughts on the ways in which government policy could help improve inner city bus transit? Yeah, I, I think when you look at Ontario, uh, and the 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 improve the the uh, rural city the rural locations. I think I think you have to look to the inner community funding project that was put out recently. Uh, that I understand is temporary. That that's an excellent way to do it. And Graham was a proponent and sat and discussed with the government long term on on solutions to that. Uh, but when it comes to rural community gaps. Um, I think when we look at it, we, we wonder, well, where are the gaps? Because you do have Ontario Northland transportation subsidized uh, running uh, rural routes. Uh, you have Go Transit that's servicing a lot of the rural communities. And so if I was to, uh, to answer that uh, in closing, I'd say uh, I think a lot of subsidized transits has already looked after some of the rural routes, but definitely the inner community funding project should be looked at, expanded and, uh, and made permanent. Great, I appreciate it. And do you think that um, provides enough of an incentive for uh, companies like yourself to make it financially viable to provide those kinds of transportation links? I think for ourselves, uh, uh, no, but I think for some companies that did, that did bid on the RFPs, I think they'd say yes. Uh, they have a different model, uh, different size buses. Um, so I think for a company like Greyhound and some of the larger ones, there would probably need to be some enhanced funding uh, or gap funding off the fare box to uh, make it long-term viable. Great, I appreciate that. I know my time is probably very limited. So really quick to Park Ridge uh, community. I, I'm wondering, so do the, do the homeowners, do they pay like an annual lease similar to like a condo fee or something like that to, to the land lease company? One minute. Uh, yes, so it, in addition to buying and owning the home, there's a, a relatively 
a modest monthly land lease uh, fee. And then uh, depending on what maintenance the, the uh, community provides through rec centers and some uh, stuff, there's uh, potentially also a maintenance fee. But okay. the entire package tends to be, still be far more affordable than conventional housing. Yeah, that was my next question is, is like that fee plus the lease on the house is less less than most people's leases are, are sorry, mortgages, I would guess then. Yes, uh, yes, overall our, our housing is the, generally the most affordable form of tenure for homeowners looking to get into the market, downsize in the market, uh, have an ownership interest in uh, in their homes. I appreciate that. And, um, would you be able thank to you that's all the time we have for this round we'll now turn to the official opposition for six and a half minutes who would like to begin mvp glover you may begin okay thank you very much and i want to thank all of the presenters uh, for being here i'll start uh, with a couple of questions for uh, dr de novo um you you mentioned that this the actions of charles McBeady lead to death the words that lead to death. And last week we were hearing in, in the Friday's deputations about the difference between freedom of speech and hate speech. And somebody said that hate speech is when it impedes on the safety of others. So my question is, when, when the government members are saying that they're defending Charles McVitie's uh, right to freedom of speech, how would you respond? Uh, well, certainly, and I think that's a good working definition of hate speech as contrasted with freedom of speech. Um, I, I mentioned that I was ordained in 1996. I would say a large part of what I've uh, done in ministry is to, uh, you know, sadly counsel and welcome those that have come from hate-filled um, communities that profess to be faithful communities. Um, uh, certainly with banning conversion therapy, um, there's a high rate of, of suicide among those who've gone through conversion therapy. And when we heard, uh, when, when, I was, when I was on the GSA committee traveling around Ontario, when we heard from medical professions, uh, those that were religiously motivated um, uh, to try to, you know, turn gay kids straight, um, we, we heard also from the victims of that. And it's well documented now that the victims of conversion therapy, that the victims of transphobia and homo uh, bi uh, and 2S plus communities, um, uh, that they are at a far higher rate of, a rate of suicide, as I said, almost 50% for uh, attempted suicide for trans kids, um, about in the 30s, uh, depending on which study you look at, uh, for uh, bisexual, lesbian, and gay kids. So that's significant. And also homelessness, which I did not mention. Um, still, if you look on the streets of uh, any a large city or even smaller city, uh, and you see youth that are homeless, a large, much larger proportion of those than in the general population will be from the LGBTQ2 plus community. So again, it has real ramifications on children. And I think that's really important to note. Um, that it are children that suffer the most. Okay. Thank you. And the other uh, thing that the government has been offering, or some of the government members have been arguing, is that um, McVitie is entitled to uh, uh, the process, you know, of bringing this bill forward. How would you respond to that, that defense of this action, of this bill? Well, sure. I mean, anybody's <laughs> anybody's can bring anything forward, but do you have to acknowledge it? Do you have to give voice to it? Do you have to amplify it out into the community? Because by doing it, as I suggest in my presentation, the Conservative Party is putting themselves on the wrong side of history here. Uh, they're certainly uh, saying loudly and clearly, this is not a party for you if you are LGBTQ, LGBTQ2S+. Plus. It's not your party. Don't vote for us. Um, and and quite frankly, I don't think that's what they want to do. So uh, my challenge to them is, who are you as a party? Who do you speak for? If you don't speak for that community, pass this. If you do pretend to speak for this community, I eliminate this. Okay. And also, would you say the same applies to the Muslim community in Canada? Absolutely. I mean, to call it a war machine, to call Islam a war machine, um, uh, you know, uh, 
is, is and to support, which I didn't have time to say, uh, speakers uh, from other countries who are what we would call Islamophobic, um, is is hateful uh, and again results in death. We've seen attacks on mosques in this country, um, and also again it, not just for Muslims for Canadian Jewish Congress back in 1998. Again, another attempt by this college to get accreditation rejected it because they were preaching that you can, you know, become a Christian and they were supporting uh, Jews that were converting to Christianity against the wishes of Canadian Jewish Congress. So uh, there you have two pretty large communities who are speaking with one mind about about this college and about this section. Okay, thank you very much for being here. Uh, my next question is for Stuart. Stuart, I've spoken with, we had a couple of, dep couple of deputants with different um, uh, bus industries or bus companies and I've spoken to one of them also as part of a delegation talking about the tourism industry and the impact of the pandemic. My understanding, I'm just going to reach out for clarification here, is the big challenge with uh, Schedule 16 and 24 of the current bill is that they open it up to Quebec companies that uh, can use their, their access to the Montreal market to give them a competitive advantage over the Ontario companies. And that you know, if these schedules are passed, it could be a death knell for Ontario bus companies. Is that a fair assessment? Have I got that right? Absolutely. And I'm open to clarification, yeah. One minute. Yeah, absolutely uh, a bang on statement. Uh, on the charter side, again, anyone can come in from Quebec and operate a charter in, in Ontario. And that would be the same on, um, on the scheduled service side. So I think that that is a major concern for the Ontario uh, coach providers, bus providers. Okay, so so the, the bus companies, the Ontario bus companies seem pretty unified in their voice asking this government to remove schedules 16 and 24 from the bill. Is that fair? Is that uh, clear? My discussions with many of the companies, I would say that that's fair, yes. Okay, thank you very much. I'm almost out of time. I want to thank the other, I'm sorry I didn't get to ask questions of Sandy and Robert, but thank you very much for being here. And thank you to all the, de all the delegates for being here and taking the time to speak to us. Thank you very much. At this point, we'll turn to the government. Uh, MPP Harris, you may begin. You have six and a half minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And, and thank you to everybody who's taken the time to come and present here uh, today. Obviously, some, uh, some very poignant thoughts have uh, been brought forward to the committee. Um, I wanted to start uh, where MPP Glover left off with, um, with, with Stuart from Greyhound. Uh, I've, I've had an opportunity to, to talk to a lot of people um, that operate bus lines out of Waterloo region and, and southwestern Ontario um, and, and the member from Waterloo as well probably has had a chance to speak with great Canadian coach lines um, and Larry Hunt. I know he's been very vocal about this and I think he's, he's been generally supportive of, of what, what we're trying to do here. Um, and increase competition for consumers. But the one thing that I, I know he's been very vocal about is the timelines of this, especially with, with COVID. This has been something that, that has been talked about for, I think, from what I understand, a couple of years. So it's, it's certainly not a surprise that, that we're going down this road, but I, I, I do share some of his concerns um, and some of the concerns that you've raised around timelines here today. So I, I think we can all agree that competition is a good thing for consumers. Uh, we're certainly not trying to push anybody out of the market. Um, but at the same time, with what's happening with the downturn in ridership right now, I was hoping maybe you could provide a little bit more insight into what, what sort of timelines would be a little bit more acceptable to the industry um, and, and your company maybe specifically as being one of the biggest players in the industry. Uh, and you know, if if we were looking to do any amendments, or if we were looking to to change some of that, um, what would you see as as more of an appropriate timeline for putting something like this forward? I think when you look at uh, you know, they just you know, and you and you hit it right up the nail on the head. The the impact, and and, and I've talked to Larry many times on the same issue. Um, it's going to, I think the timeline is difficult to say when are things going to improve? When are the private bus carriers going to be able to be sustainable off the fare box or by charter revenue? And a lot of it's going to depend on the recovery from the pandemic. So there's a lot of unknowns, as we all know. When are the customers going to be confident in spending money to ride on buses? 
Uh, and so, you know, our uh, dealing with uh, inner city bus and trends and travel and competition all over Canada, uh, you had this pandemic. I, I would think that, you know, this is a year and a half to a two year recovery. Um, and that's without any help from uh, the government, which is really another topic. But I think you're looking at a significant recovery time for a lot of these business to try and stay up, stay upright and, and, uh, and operate. Before the pandemic, what was ridership like? Um, you know, sort of year over year, were you seeing increases? What is it, was it saying pretty stagnant? Um, or, or, or was there a bit of a decrease in ridership, say, you know, over the last couple of years? Two pieces to that answer. Uh, we're very trendy. Uh, a lot of it depends on uh, time of year. You know, there's four or five times a year when school's in or out or holidays where we were seeing, uh, we're actually seeing some positive trends year over year where, where, uh, you know, slight uptick in, in, in previous year, you know, single digit uptick, uptake on some of the corridors. But again, uh, you know, we've seen, we've seen rural, rural ridership decline for, for years. Um, and so I think a lot of the carriers were seeing some positive and then all of a sudden, bam, you got in March, like it ended. Um, and that, that's been the, really the, the whole thing about this. But I think there was some positives in the prior year Pre-pandemic, and and I certainly I, I wouldn't suppose that you'd be able to say this for other companies, but for for your company <laughs> specifically, what what have been I guess you could say kind of the most popular routes that you've that you've maybe seen an uptake in ridership? Uh, well, I think when you look at our business in Ontario, the Highway 401 corridor, some of the Highway 400s uh, coming out of the Niagara Falls area, uh, again, a lot of them are depending on travel trends, so. Uh, I don't think you're going to have any issue uh, with people competing on the Highway 401 uh, in a deregulated environment. Uh, again, it's just the timing and, and the ability for those companies to get prepared for, you know, uh, the ultimate uh, deregulation, if that's the way the government goes. It seems that that's what they're looking to do. Thank you, Stuart. Um, how much time, Madam Chair? One minute and 45 seconds. <laughs> I'll try and be quick. Okay, Sandy and Robert. Um, there's been a lot of talk in Waterloo Region about tiny homes over the last little while. Um, and I know that's probably not your expertise, but I wanted to ask, just because when we're talking about land lease, is that something that you think um, could work for that type of situation where someone could, um, you know, have, have a designated lot, they could build or, or trailer in, say, a tiny home, um, and then go ahead and lease that land? Is that, do you think that that's something that's in the realm of possibility? Yeah, in fact, I would agree, and particularly as it relates to land lease, that when we take land purchase out of the equation, uh, what people normally find with tiny homes is that the land cost is what makes tiny homes unworkable. But we have uh, a number of communities that incorporate much smaller homes into them very successfully in land lease. Uh, I have a, a community in uh, Elmvale near Barrie uh, with homes that are 532 to about 700 square feet. And it's a vibrant community with very affordable housing that provides a very significant opportunity for seniors in that community. Uh, and that model would work any number of locations across the province to bring more affordable housing to, uh, to people in this province. Thank you very much. I assume we're pretty tight on time now, so I will uh, finish up there. Ten seconds. All right. <laughs> thank you. Thank and you thank very you much. to the community. Thank you very much, everyone. At this point, I'd like to thank our presenters for taking the time to be here with us today. You may now uh, step down. You're released from committee. And uh, just a reminder that uh, committee will resume at 1 p.m. today. Thank you, everyone. We are, we are now in recess. <laughs>